Hey what is going on everyone, I'm Wicked and today I'm going to show you how easy it is to maintain the state of your block build application with the hydrated block package. This is a topic that is often omitted, but to be honest I think it's one of the most important pillars of a Flutter application. By default, every application you'll build inside Flutter won't be able to maintain its state after rebooting. As an example, we'll take a look at our current counter app. If we increment the counter to 5 and then hit the restart button, the state of the application will revert back to its initial state. So in order to avoid this, we'll need to somehow store the entire state of our application so that whenever the application reboots, it will be able to access the already stored data. Beforehand though, you'll need to check out the content overview for today's video and its specific timestamps. So without further ado, let's get right into it. Okay, so states, we've all been talking about them since the beginning of this tutorial series. We learned that a state is a group of data that is stored inside the application at a moment in time, right? Remember, Block Library is a powerful state management solution. Block Library helped us create the state, but now it's our duty to help it store, therefore maintain them. The way we're going to do this is by using the hydrated block package. In order to understand how hydrated block works, we need to see where, and more importantly how, it stores the data of our app. So where are we going to store all of our data? This place needs to be fast and close to the application. Therefore, the most intuitive solution would be actually the local storage of the device the application runs on. You may have heard that every app running on an Android device will benefit from its own internal storage where it can store some of its data. So this is where Hydrated Block will also have access to store our application state. Let's start with this first. I'll open up my previous project inside VS Code, a project that can be found on my GitHub page which is listed in the description. Then we'll need to add the Hydrated Block dependency so we'll open up the pubspec.yaml file and list it right there. We'll also need a path provider dependency because this will help Flutter retrieve the path for the storage of different devices the application may be installed on. Now we'll need to tell Hydrated Block what will be the accessible storage area required to store our data onto. To do that, inside the main function from our main.dart file, we need to set up its storage. This hydrated.build function asynchronously creates the connection from the hydrated block to the storage on where it's going to store the data. By default, if we're not mentioning anything to the storage directory parameter of the function, the data will be stored to a temporary storage, which can be easily removed by the operating system at any time, so it's not really recommended to store anything there. Instead, we could set the storage to the one provided by Android for the current app. This entire line of code will call native code to initialize the required storage and link it to hydrated block. But in order to do that, we need to initialize the widget bindings before we start building our app. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to call the native code. So keep that in mind. Okay, so currently we established the connection between hydrated block and the app storage layer. Now all we need to find out is how hydrated block will interpret and save the data we want to be stored inside that storage layer. And the answer is JSONs. You must have heard about JSONs before. I talked about them in my fourth tutorial on block architecture when I said that the data fetch from the outside of the app may come in a JSON file format. So similar to how the app can import the data from a JSON format, the same thing can happen vice versa. The application can also export the data to a JSON format. What's left for us right now is to decide which data we want to save in the storage. So let's start by maintaining the state of the counter qubit. The state of the counter qubit is found in the counter state class. So let's code that first. As I told you a couple of moments ago, we'll need to export the data of this class into a JSON. Later on, hydrated block will take the exported JSON and store it safely into the storage. You can easily create the to JSON and from JSON methods of an already existing class by clicking Ctrl plus period and then by selecting JSON serialization. This is only available through the Dart Data Class Generator VS Code module. I know a lot of you asked me what this module was, so here it is installed on my VS Code. As you can see, 
the module generated all the functions we needed for our counter state class implementation. Now I want you to understand why it created four methods to map, from map, to JSON, and from JSON. A JSON is a file having the .json extension appended to its name. This is mostly how an API will reply to your HTTP request. Dart language can only understand its own types of data, like integers, doubles, booleans, maps, lists, and so on and so forth. It doesn't have a special type called JSON, so we'll need to take the JSON file, which is mainly a really large string, and decode it to a type Dart is familiar with. The type that is similar to the structure of a JSON is the map. Similar to a JSON, a map keeps multiple key value pairs inside it. So we have the JSON file. We'll decode it into a map variable using the fromJSON method. Then we'll use the map to create a class instance with the fromMap method. Vice versa, if we have an instance of a class with some data inside it, we'll use the toMap method to create a map out of that specific instance. Then use the toJSON method to create a JSON file out of that map. And that's the entire process of converting an instance of a class to a completely storable JSON and vice versa. That's the purpose of all these four methods and that's how helpful this Dart data class generator function is. Imagine how much time it would take to manually write these functions. So at this point, the counter state class can be fully exported and imported to and from JSONs. Now we want to find out where and when hydrated block will come into action. So let's switch our attention to the counter qubit class. For a block or qubit to become hydrated, that is for the state of a block or qubit to be saved and retrieved from the storage, we need to use the hydrated mixing to the class. Note that we can also use the hydrated qubit or hydrated block extension of the counter state class instead of using the hydrated mixing. As you can see, Dart warns us that we need to override the two methods of the hydrated mixing from JSON and to JSON. These two methods are the pillars of storing and saving the state to the storage while also being able to retrieve it back when the app is rebooted. Take in mind also that these methods should have been called from map and to map since all they do is import and export a map type from the storage. Since a JSON is most of the time translated into a map, it is acceptable to call them from JSON and to JSON, but you have to keep in mind the difference. All we have to do now is to implement those functions. You need to take in mind that the toJSON function is called for every state emitted by the counter qubit and that the fromJSON function is called every time the application needs the locally stored data. Let's call the toJSON method first. So every time there is a new counter state emitted with the new counter value, we want to save its data to a map and then send it to the hydrated block to store it onto the local storage. When we'll want the app to access the last saved data from the local storage, hydrated block will call the fromJSON function and retrieve the JSON, which is already converted into a map, as I told you before. We'll need to return a new instance of the counter state populated with the data from that map, so we'll use the counter state from map method for that to happen. If we finally save and run the project now, you'll see that after we increment the value to 5 and then restart the application, the value will still remain 5. And that's the exact behavior that we wanted. To understand this tutorial much more in depth, let me get the whiteboard one more time and simulate every step of the process. So we have the app, the counter qubit with its hydrated block plugin attached, the counter state and our storage components. We have a counter value of 0, the initial value of the counter qubit. When a user presses the plus button, the increment function from inside the qubit is triggered, causing the counter qubit to emit a new counter state with an incremented value of 1. Here, the hydrated block is notified that a new state has been dispatched and calls the toJSON function. The toJSON function will call the toMap method from inside the counter state, which takes all the attributes of the class and their values and puts them into a map. So right now we'll have a map which looks exactly like this. This map is then being taken care of by the hydrated block plugin, therefore being stored onto the storage. Now let's say the app got killed or has been restarted by the user. When it will be opened again, hydrated block will retrieve the last known data from the storage as a map of data. Then with the help of fromJSON method of counter qubit, 
and with the help of from map method of counter state, it will create a new instance of counter state with the previously stored values, thus ending the cycle and maintaining the counter state. You might be wondering, well, what if we have a ton of read and write operations from the storage? Won't that slow down the application? No, hydrogen block is not only a really useful plugin, but it's also really optimized. And that's thanks to the Hive package that it used under the hood to store the data. Hive is the most efficient way of storing data. Take a look at these benchmarks. It's absolutely blazing fast. So, to sum up, every state from your blocks or qubits can be maintained and saved to the storage. All you need to do is to decide which ones you want to keep in storage and which ones you don't. For example, inside this application you may store the state of the counter qubit and the state of the settings qubit. But you won't need to store the state of internet qubit since the state of the internet connection must be retrieved constantly even when you reboot the app. Anyways, this was the tutorial for today, I hope you like it, if you did, please make sure you smash that like button, share the video with all your colleagues and friends, and subscribe to my channel. Also, if you have any questions, please write me a comment down below and I'll reply as soon as possible. We're almost at the end of this amazing tutorial series, a single tutorial splits us apart from the finish line. Until the next tutorial, stay safe, take care, work it out, bye bye.